A few weeks ago, I had the experience of training like a pro MMA fighter together with a real professional fighter, Oliver Enkam. After the intense week of training, Oliver and I sat down to talk about what it's like to train like a pro MMA fighter and to discuss my experience of trying out his training regime. We're here, we finished the last session of uh, Pankers Gym training with Omar. And I'm curious to hear uh, you sum, sum up the week. What was your first impression and uh, how did it differ from your expectations? If it differed at all. I knew it was going to be intense. So part of me was concerned. Will I be able to survive this like, fully? And there were challenging moments. Like uh, I followed my whoop all the time and red zone 32 and that was the most intense day. So in the like, morning you were... I was already redlining. Yeah, right? okay. Right, I was like... Bad oh. recovery, right. but the hardest day of the week. Right, right. And I was like, damn, if I'm going to be on the red line all the time, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. But then yeah. the next day was uh, a bit lighter and then mm. there was a nice balance between the, the two and I feel like I started getting into it. Like initially like my muscles weren't as tired. But uh, eventually, like, I felt that piling up. Mm. Like, sometimes my brain was fine, and I think that's what my whoop was also representing. Yeah. Like, oh, the recovery is fine. Like, my mm. heart is fine. And, like, my brain is fine. My neural system is fine. But, like, my body's, like, slow, intense. Yeah. So I think that's where I probably would need, like, a few days of recovery to just really, like, get a clean sheet. So, but all in all, though, like, today we did a session, aside from not having carbs, enough carbs. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I survived, and by the end yeah. of it, I was like, actually, I was more alive than I thought. Okay. So yeah, that 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 was one thing which mm. really stood out for me. The mm. other one, uh, we spoke about that in the car. It's, it was really nice to have you as a guide, but also even more so as a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer the martial artist mindset to understand how things work, and yeah. not everyone has those answers. But whenever I would have a question for you, and I'd ask you that, you'd be like. Oh, it's like this. And it's like that. It's like yeah. this. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is just what I need. This is just what yeah. I want to hear. Like you have very clear, definitive answers. So that was very cool as well. So those are the two things. The first mm. two things that come to my mind. Mm. Uh, that's, that's fun to hear. So pe people say often, I think, being like uh, two martial artists, and in comparison to fighters or athletes, uh, right. being more analytical. It's it's a big um, as I told you in the car. It's it's a very good thing for me to also be a teacher at mm. another gym. Right. So I have my teaching role as, as a sensei of sorts, and then I have my student role mm. uh, with my own coach and right. headmaster. And uh, so I've been exploring all of these areas mm. that that you follow me in now, mm. go, walking in, and and people always ask me like. Hey, you really seem to like teaching because I, I, I lit up <laughs> when I'm teaching because I, right. I'm so, you know, nerdy about mm. the whole martial arts and, and, and the, the fighting art. And uh, it was interesting, like, seeing how you would uh, mm. do in the different uh, mm. sessions uh, because I'm not sure to what training you're used to. Right. So how would you compare it to the, mm. the training you're used to doing before? I know you've done kickboxing back home, right. but... You've also done training at SPG and BJJ, right? Mm -hmm. So was it very different? First off, just the sessions themselves were quite different. Like mm -hmm. every coach was mm. bringing something something different to the table. Uh, and a fair amount of experiences were similar. Like one thing which was interesting for me is that during the Muay Thai, the sparring was happening at, at an early stage, mm. which is something we spoke about. And I think that's a great idea. Yeah. But I'm usually used to like sparring is at the end, sparring is at the end. So that was like, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Uh, so that was like that surprised me, but but still, sparring is sparring. Mm. Uh, I think the class which stood out for me most yeah. was actually your MMA session that you okay. taught, because I really saw the structure and logic behind it, mm. and I feel you. It was a very good balance between the amount of information and amount of practice. Mm. Like it was like just what it, I feel like like just what we needed. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to show you now this, and you could do this, yeah. and you can do that. And you can, by the end, you're like, so which one do I do? Like, yeah. It was like, just what I needed, and I memorized it. And, and yeah, the details you pointed out were like perfect. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed that. And on a similar note, it was different, but also great in Pancras, that there was so much drilling. And mm -hmm. I think it did remind me a little bit of SBG Ireland to some degree. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
there, it's kind of our 50-50 drilling sparring. And yeah. here I really appreciated that it was like drilling and drilling and drilling yeah. and drilling. And I feel like I really liked that part. Mm. There wasn't as much details, this works like this, but yeah. I had a lot of chance to explore and try mm. things yeah. and like keep tweaking things. And also I had you next to me and you'd be like, hey, try this. I'm like, oh, yeah. this is great. <laughs> so yeah, those were different. So there were a lot of similarities to what I experienced in the past, but there were also significant differences. Mm. Um, what about yourself when you traveled so much and you trained in different places? How yeah. is it for you to train and teach here? Like, yeah, I, I think places? I've, over the years, developed what I find to be the best balance of mm. everything. And uh, I learned a very good concept from Ido Portal, mm -hmm. the movement coach. Yeah. Uh, he was talking about when you're learning a new movement, mm. no matter what kind, say it's a submission or a new kick or something, you need to train it in three steps mm. called isolation, integration mm. and improvisation. Mm. So I always have this mindset when I teach my classes. Mm. So first of all, I, I introduce the, techniques, the technique to the students. They, we isolate it. We take it out of its context, just try this technique, this movement, this is how it works. Then we integrate it, so mm. we add our footwork, our defense, mm. and maybe we do like a situational sparring drill. Right. We only work this side control escape right now. Mm. So you're my opponent, you're giving me a little resistance. Mm. As soon as I hit the, the escape technique, I put myself back in that position. That's the integration and then the improvisation, which must come from you as a mm. practitioner. So that's why we always have sp the free sparring. Mm. Or uh, you could do it in shadow boxing for mm. a beginner's group, perhaps. But it's, uh, it's the moment when the technique doesn't come from me as a teacher to you as a student, mm. but it comes from your decision. So you're shadow boxing and you decide to throw this kick that you just mm. learned. Or you're in sparring and you decide to go for the takedown you just drilled mm. for two hours or mm. an hour, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So those three steps uh, are super important. And I haven't seen any other gym mm. really using this format or this right. structure. Mm -hmm. It's mostly like you do one technique, you do another technique, and then you just go spar. Do whatever it, you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not really a thought out process from start to finish. Mm. So in my opinion, the training starts already from the warm up. Mm. So the movements we're doing in the warm up, you're gonna see them in the technique, which is then gonna transfer to the inter integration, the situation and the sparring, and then to the improvisation, which mm -hmm. is at the end. Yeah. So my sessions all, always follow this line. Yeah. I think it's my experience speaks to what you just described, uh, both from what I learned from you and actually in Pancras. During the week, during the sparrings, what I learned here came up, mm. which is I think is not as often, like actually the way you described the training methodology, I did experience a similar approach from Matt Thornton in SBG Portland and I love it, mm. but even his coaches, most of them don't do the same thing. Mm. Uh, so I think I, I have a feeling as well, like it's very rare, but I find it to be an amazing way of, of teaching. And as I said, like I think that speaks to the effectiveness that during the week when we grappled, like, uh, or sparred, yeah. there was a one or two moments where I would, went into the, the clinch and did the, the takedown. Oh, like, yeah. Then uh, the Muay Thai clinch, mm. tripping someone. Mm. I learned it just like for the first time, I never yeah. learned much tripping. And then right. you taught it in such a way where during the sparring, I was like, hey, yeah, the Oliver showed that. I'm like, oh, yeah. it worked. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, so, yeah, so it shows that the, the things really transmit here mm. versus there's sometimes I go to train somewhere and I learn a bunch of techniques. And I'm like, I'm not even sure what I learned the next day, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let alone to integrating it into sparring. I also feel a lot of uh, coaches, they, they forget the bridge between the technique and right. the sparring part. So you train a technique super mm. light and right. easy, and then you're going to full sparring. Mm -hmm. You think the students are going to be able to pull it off? 
right. no no chance. Right, right. So that's why you need to do super light sparring and drilling, right. or you decide you just do defend 50% strength right now, yeah. so I can hit off my technique. Yeah. So that bridge in between, the integration part, mm -hmm. is so important, but so many coaches and just forget about it. Right, right. Yeah, there was actually a nice moment for me in the Pancras today. I like the very first part where it's jab is free, right, and then the other yeah. hand is to the body. Like mm. I connected a few body shots, and I was like, they were like fairly clean mm. because, but I'm sure they would have come mm. up, and I would have done them if, if I wasn't like, okay, this hand is body only. This hand is yeah. so I was searching for it really, like hard mm. or like really fo with focus, and then it came up. Mm. Versus if I would be only doing like, okay, just do whatever. Yeah. Probably right, right. I would just, you know, hit the head, yeah. hit the head, hit the head. The body probably wouldn't come, come in. Yeah. I'm like, oh, actually it's possible. Actually yeah. it's, it works. Yeah. So that conditional sparring as well, like, yeah. it's pretty cool. Because if you're free to do whatever you want every time mm. you spar, yeah. you always fall into the same patterns. You mm. do what you're good at already. Right. So I think that's a great thing that you take away certain weapons. Mm. Right. So I like to do, uh, for example, uh, hands versus kicks. Mm. So in a Thai boxing session, you're only allowed to, to attack with punches, mm. but you can defend my kicks. Yeah. And I'm allowed to attack with kicks, but I can defend with my guard. Mm. So this kind of uh, situational sparring give, gives you new looks and, and makes you explore new areas that you're probably not that comfortable in. Like only boxing and clinching, perhaps, mm -hmm. for someone who always stays on the outside using their kicks. Right, right. So to make you go into those uncomfortable areas and develop more as a, mm -hmm. as a fighter. That's one of the things I appreciated from you pointing out during, during this week for me, was that uh, when I asked you for feedback, like what stood out for you in my sparring, and you mentioned that there's stiffness, and the counter exercise you suggested to me because yeah. I have my long reach, my tendency is to stay out, stay out. Mm. And then when it's, things start to get tight, I'm like, yeah. oh, this is not really my realm yeah. and yeah. I'm not sure what to do. And that's, I think, the tenseness, mm. you, you spot it really well. The tenseness does come from me from like, I'm, I'm tense even from distance because mm. I really don't want the person to come in yeah. inside. Yeah. And then you suggested for me to just Letting. allow myself, yeah, work on the defense, let them yeah. come in and, and yeah. try to work from there and search for those counter punches yeah. and use the angles. And what was funny, that's only my first impression, I may be wrong, but it almost seemed to me that I did better than uh, when I was in that mm. trying to make sure yeah. that to keep the person out. There I was like, hey, there's a strike here, there's a strike yeah. here, there's a strike here. And my, I didn't get as tired. Right. Yeah. And I was like, why wasn't I doing that before? Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> so interesting it's really how how we always try to work around the problems right. instead of taking them face on. Because right. I used to be the same guy, mm -hmm. you know, come from yeah. karate, comfortable at long distance. Right. I never wanted to stay in the pocket, you know, mm -hmm. trading punches. So I would find ways kind of around that, but I never addressed the problem, becoming comfortable taking punches. Mm -hmm. But when I did that, man, everything changed. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I started landing my kicks way more because my punches were setting them up. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, that, re that really appealed to me. And I already started seeing results, which is awesome. That's very encouraging. But I, I just, when you said it, it made so much sense. And I feel like that's true. Like, mm. I have this intuitive feeling that if I will get comfortable trading punches and defending, or especially yeah. defense, then uh, I probably will become much more comfortable from a far distance because I won't be totally. worried. Like, yeah. it's like yeah, if you exactly. come in, it's fine. Yeah. It's not a problem versus like, oh my god, oh my god, yeah, yeah. how do you keep that person Don't come in! <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah good. So that was very useful. Uh, I'll check the percentage, fine. So if I, so we got to spend a whole week together. Mm. And uh, I had a chance to experience you as a coach. And you had the chance to experience me as a student. So what would be your suggestions for me as I continue my mixed martial arts journey, uh, what do you think would be good for me to focus on or integrate in my training, anything like for my I, future? I, I would uh, probably echo Omar's words, mm. boxing and wrestling. He said okay. boxing and wrestling, mm. from foundations for MMA. And mm. since, since you told me you wanted to do another fight yeah. in MMA, mm. I think those two areas are probably the most important to focus on. 
because you have the reach mm -hmm. uh, and you can use your kicks. Uh, but people don't kick as much in MMA as they mm -hmm. do in Thai boxing and kickboxing. Way less, and and you've done a lot of jujitsu, mm -hmm. but as you notice, the MMA wrestling is a lot different, more high pace. So it's more about the wrestling, wrestling than the jujitsu wrestling. Right. Um, so as we spoke about just now, getting comfortable in the hands, in the pocket, exchanging mm -hmm. punches, yeah. uh, and then working on that wrestling. Those two aspects are probably going to help you the most for your MMA fight, I think, right. at this stage. I'm thinking the puzzle piece for me to solve is the wrestling part, mm. because I'm, I'm less, maybe I can search for wrestling around Vilnius, who knows, maybe there's something. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also thinking, because I go to Jiu-Jitsu, I tend to go to Nogi, mm. which I guess is a bit closer to... Yeah. Do you do any stand-up wrestling in those classes? So I try to, I, but a lot of people don't feel comfortable doing it. Most people agree if I'm like, can we start standing? They're like, yeah, and then I see them like, oh no. <laughs> and they're gonna sit down and pull you and go. Right. <laughs> Most don't, luckily, okay. but, but they don't feel comfortable either. Okay. They don't really okay. know what to do. Sure. And, and so that's, yeah, that's also a downside. Yeah. But I guess, so let's say if you were in that situation, mm -hmm. your best bet is to go to Nogi Jiu Jitsu. Is there some sort of approach you would take to compensate that and to make it more kind of wrestling-esque? Or like maybe, like, and I'll actually share some ideas I have and I am hoping that maybe they're the right direction. Mm. So what I noticed during this week, I feel comfortable being on the bottom mm. during the wrestling or mm. while grappling. And I realized, well, that's not the place to be in MMA. I'm no. like, I go there way too often. Yeah. Like if we're falling down, I wouldn't resist the falling down so much. I'd be like, whoa, well, okay, I go to the garden yeah. and then there's strikes and there's strikes yeah. like, shit. Why did I <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't know, I'm thinking maybe, maybe it could be helpful for me to change my perspective and focus on more kind of wrestling principles doing no-gi. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, so, so if you go to no-gi classes, you could uh, keep in mind that the, your opponent can strike you at any time, even, even if he's not. Practice like he is allowed to strike you. Right. How would you react? How would you wrestle? You would not try to pull guard, right? You would try to get on top mm. and make top position a priority because okay. that's what wins fights, you know? Right. Catching a submission, that's plan B. Plan A is getting on top, you mm. know? And yeah. keeping the control. Okay. So, yeah, start, always start by by focusing on that, getting to the back or getting the top, uh, because there's all these scramble situations. Whenever you go for the takedown, boom, you're gonna re start wrestling to who gets the top position, you know. But you don't find that really in in nogi or in jujitsu the same way, mm -hmm. because the pace is not as high when you scramble without punches and stuff. Right. I see. So. On the other hand, if you do a fight here, mm. you will do what we call amateur MMA B class, which is mm. no strikes on the ground. Yeah. So it will be more like no gi. True. Yeah. Mm. But still wrestling though. Yeah. Yeah. The takedowns and like what? You were about to say something. Huh? No, no. I, I'm. I was just thinking because still, if you if you're on the bottom and you don't pull off a submission, you lose the round. Mm. Right, and there's only two rounds in amateur MMA here in Sweden, right. so losing a round, <laughs> that's half the fight, mm. you just lost, you know? Right. It's yeah. not worth it. Because for some reason, then, uh, it, I may be wrong, but like, especially like we looked at the long guard today, yeah. and you commented that actually that seems to suit me quite well. That worked great. Mm. Yeah. So I feel like if I start working on that, that's great, and it's convenient for me to know that my Jiu Jitsu is not terrible. Like it's it's okay, I think. Yeah. And then if somebody like if there's grappling, it's not like I'm like, oh no, this is grappling. It's like okay, this is grappling. Mm. But part of me also feels like I would want to become good at defending takedowns. Mm. Like uh, and I feel like I see these tall fighters usually, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm. but I think the tall fighters are usually good at uh, defending against takedowns. Yeah. Like because. It's like, this is my reach, this is my reach. And mm. the, the smaller guys, I presume, they will want to go to take me down because like, that's most convenient for them to mm. counter my reach. Yeah. 
then I would ideally be very comfortable at making sure I defend that. Does that make sense? Or? Uh, I, I understand your logic, right. but from my experience, mm -hmm. it's not the right way to go. Okay. I would have the same mindset as you, coming from a striking background with karate mm -hmm. and kickboxing. I right. thought, I'll just work my takedown <laughs> defense. Right, yeah. But there's so much going, going into a good takedown. Just knowing the defense mm. is not enough. Right. Because when you mix it with punches, you got to know the timing. Mm. And then you have the cage and the, the fighting area, how you cut it off. And it's much harder to stop a takedown from someone who really wants to take you down when they also punch you full force than you can ever experience in a training, you know, environment. Mm. So what's better investing your timing is getting good at scrambles, mm. which means getting back up on the feet as soon as you hit the ground. Yeah. Because if you know you're good at scrambles, then you won't be afraid of getting taken down. If you approach me, on the feet with takedown defensive mind, it means you're approaching me with a defensive mindset. So you're not gonna get full effect from your strikes. Mm. But if you know your scrambles are very good, mm. you can really... Uh, Engage. Yeah, yeah, you can really use your strikes and commit to them because you know, I might get taken down, but as soon as we hit the mat, I'm gonna mm. pop back up. Nice. So it makes puts you in more of an offensive mindset than a defensive mindset. Right. And I've seen it time and time again against this good mm. striker-wrestler matchups. Mm. Those who go in with a defensive mindset, mm. working their sprawls and frames, they get taken down. Eventually, yeah. Yeah, but those who focus on their offense and really mm. putting the hands on the wrestler, they're way more successful. Mm. And when if they get taken down, you work on your scrambles, get on top. Again, a lot of these things are new and I'm just thinking out loud uh, and wondering if that's a little bit similar to the John Jones situation, the way you described it, where he is not afraid to actually go after the things that his opponents are good at. Yeah. It's like, it almost feels like from what I heard about him from you, that it's not like he has this one thing that he defends and, and puts in a box himself mm. and tries to live there. Mm. But like potentially one of the things which makes him great is that he goes for all of those things yeah. and he doesn't mind. Just and he, he often goes to the area where the opponent is the strongest, right. which is what they will expect the least. Right. So yeah. from a long, lanky fighter like him, you think he would always stay on the outside. Right. Yeah. And he's great at that but then you will build a game plan around it. Mm -hmm. So suddenly he goes into your distance and do what you're good at because he can do everything. And that completely puts you off, you know? Like, oh shit, this wasn't what's supposed to happen. We didn't know he would fight like this. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a great fight that comes uh, to mind is when John Jones fought Glover Teixeira, mm. who is a much shorter but powerful kind of boxer, mm. boxer, jiu-jitsu guy mm -hmm. and uh, John Jones would go into the clinch with him all the time and he would use like his overhooks to jank his arms and throw elbows and use his head over here you know mm -hmm. even though John Jones is way taller right. and he could just stay on the outside right. Right. but completely put Glover Teixeira off like oh he's coming into my distance right. you know it's not prepared for that he probably worked a lot in his fight camp on cutting the yeah. the the space and you know right. getting in there and yeah. now it doesn't have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. That sounds like very genius to me and I'm also thinking probably even psychologically uh, thinking about the people who train with that fighter. Mm. It's like let's say the opponent of John Jones in this case. So if someone is a really good wrestler, the teammates know that as well mm. and most likely they also try to work around that. Like yeah. they try to yeah. create counter strategies and they don't go for his best game. Yeah. So I imagine probably the best game, they're not used to like True. being challenged in their yeah. best game. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's always best to go and, and play with your strengths 
and not build your game plan too much around the opponent's strength or weaknesses mm -hmm. yeah. because he's not going to fight like the way you saw him last time because right. he's he has a new opponent right. so he's going to build a game plan around you mm -hmm. so focus on yourself and not your opponent mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah and coming back to the the narrative of my MMA journey so to speak uh, just kind of putting it a reminder for myself yeah. scrambles getting back up like I can integrate that in my nogi for sure because yeah. like as I said even in today's training and especially training in pancreas mm. whenever I would get taken down I would kind of dig myself into that situation it's okay. such, such a habit yeah. and coach Omar is like get up get up stand up I'm like Oh yeah, like that's actually right. what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I could much more, and as I said, like I wouldn't even defend as much the takedowns because I'm like, yeah, if I get taken down, it's just, you know, a continuation. Yeah. But it's like, no, I have to change that mindset. Yeah. So I think yeah. reminding myself that during the training and yeah. not playing to that, but doing the opposite, I think that'll be good for me. Yeah, being comfortable getting taken down is actually not a good thing. Right. Sounds good. Yeah, right. But it's gonna make you lose your fight. So we have uh, the most famous Swedish MMA mm. fighter is Alexander Gustafsson, mm. who fought for the light heavyweight championship mm. twice. And uh, he was so good at defending takedowns. Mm. And I asked him once, what's your secret? Like, you always sprawl and defend these takedowns. He said, oh, you know, when I got into MMA, I was purely a boxer, mm. and I was thrown into the ring, and I just panicked when somebody shot for a mm. takedown, because I didn't know what to do on the ground. Right. So it was his survival instincts kicking in, right. like, no way he's going to the ground. Right. Right, right, right. And uh, I had the opposite mindset, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm good at guard, so take me down, take I'm going to play right. the guard, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. What he said really got me thinking otherwise, like, yeah, he was so afraid of getting down, so his takedown defense became so good. Yeah. <laughs> that actually makes me think about my own journey as well, an experience that, uh, and I think it's so important for me to now work on the opposite of that, but I think one of the reasons I fell in love with the jab and I really like to go for it mm. or, or use it as a defense because I was afraid of people, especially I'm, I'm fighting better guys against yeah. me all the time. Like that's right. the situations I yeah. would get to myself all the time. And it's like, I want to make sure like I survive against them. And one of the best ways is like, okay, they're smaller. So I just want to make sure they're away, they're yeah. away. So I'm like yeah. always just pumping the jab right. and searching for ways to make sure they just mm -hmm. can't come in. Dude, I won't allow you in. I won't allow you yeah. in because I'm afraid to have you inside. Yeah. And I think that it made me feel more comfortable with using the jab. Mm. But also I think probably it's time for me to also become comfortable at the yeah. opposite so totally. that I, I could use it even more without fear. Like, like, exactly. I, like, yeah. like I liked a lot that you said, like now if I become comfortable at the opposite, I can really invest into the jab versus like, okay, yeah. I'm going to throw the jab, but I'm yeah. always ready for it to take yeah. down. So that's that sense. defensive mindset again. Right. You need to be in, in the offensive one. I like that. And it's also, we, we talked about this yesterday, having the opposite tactic of what you're doing. So when you are mm. offensive, you're right. thinking defense. Because right. when I'm hitting you, right out of nowhere, can, you, you might throw a swing at me. So I got to think defense, defense, defense when I'm attacking. Right. So I have the reflex to slip and roll yeah. away from your counters. And at the same time, when I'm defending, if I'm just staying put here, I'm going to become a punching bag for you. And you're right. going to run me over eventually. So I'm thinking offense, 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 there it is, mm -hmm. or there it is. You know, find an opening to counter so you yeah. shut the guy off. So always thinking the opposite is a, mm. also a good, uh, good I like that. advice. Mm. Yeah. There's a, until we, or before we run out of the battery, yeah. <laughs> this is the one I only want to have right now. I uh, also wanted to summarize our exchange about Aikido. Mm. That was kind of part of that week that we had together. Yeah. So just thinking about the exchanges we have does anything come up in your mind, like like a summary of that experience? 
Uh, how do you mean? Like yeah, like, you know, the Aikido, we, so essentially we explored what I call functional Aikido. Mm -hmm. So we looked at Aikido principles yeah. and MMA, yeah. and we had really great answers. We looked at the, mm. the wrestling side of it, mm. and then the stance of it. Uh, so what's your summary of looking at all of that? Does, did that bring any insights to, to you, essentially? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't really that uh, uh, developed in the in, in Aikido or, right. or in, in the principles and stuff, but it was very interesting when you explained these principles and I could straight away apply them to combat sports, um, but with a little different twist, mm. obviously. And then it was also interesting to hear you ask Omar about mm. Aikido and he would have similar viewpoints mm. uh, of the footwork and, mm. and like closing the distance and yeah. also the correlation to the sword mm. uh, in, in the Aikido stance and, mm. and stuff. So, so uh, it definitely gave me a new look of Aikido and, and seeing mm. how essentially all martial arts are more or less the same or use mm. the same principles at least mm -hmm. because it's always two human bodies, right. bodies interacting and we have two right. arms and two legs and it, they work the same way but then they might be used for different purpose in different martial arts. Right. But yeah. there's a lot of parallels and it's fun to see you starting mm -hmm. using these more when you grapple. Mm -hmm. Also yesterday you caught me in, in a wrist lock yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I think if you would have pulled that more you would have gotten mm -hmm. it but right. of course you were nice. Well, uh, not only that, uh, I think because I, that made me think about it as well mm. and our explorations and sometimes I feel like it reminds me of the process which I noticed in BGJ where somebody, let's say, submits me in some submission initially I don't even know what happened. I'm like, hey, mm. what's that submission? And somebody's like, well, that's a Dars. Mm. Oh, okay, that's a Dars. And then I, I, re I memorize that comes from side control, whatever. Yeah. And then the next time I'm like, oh, that person is about to... Or, Okay, they submit me, I'm like, oh, that was a Dars, I know. The next time, I'm like, oh, they're going for a Dars, and yeah. I cannot do anything about it, but I say, ah, that was a Dars, I see it's it. coming, yeah. right. And then the defense starts to kick in, yeah. and then I start to learn it as well. Right. So, so when you kind of fail, but then later you're like, ah, oh, you add this mm. thing. So that happened to me with our exchange and the, the Koregeshi, the wrist mm. lock that I was doing. It, one of the big discoveries for me during our Aikido slash wrestling mm -hmm. session mm -hmm. was connection yeah and the using the hips mm. and the kuzushi essentially yeah and i thought i just noticed that most likely aikido techniques will become much more effective when that is actually added and i started thinking in my mind after that failed wrist i mean it still gave me an opening or whatever but i didn't take it down i thought if i would like come in with my hips connect with you mm. and and mm. maybe you know grab like yeah. push a leg or something i still have to play with it but i see like the potential of oh, maybe that can actually be improved way more. Because as we spoke during the Aikido exchange, so much in Aikido is happening here. Right, it's like in far front, away from your right, body. There's actually very little connection. Yeah. But if the connection like here as well, like the wrist, I was mm -hmm. playing it with it in front. But if I would close in, and connect yeah. with the hips, start to balance, maybe yeah. something new can come, come up. You want to ask me? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so that was already like a, a whole doorway for me opening up. Mm. And just in general, I feel like those exchanges we've had, like if I look at my whole uh, functional Aikido journey, uh, and many times, especially at early stages of it, I was quite skeptical of it myself, where I was like, mm, it was interesting to explore it, but, but I never expected to like make any breakthroughs because I thought like, well, if it would be, be sure then. Izzy wants to go out. <laughs> we'll, we'll finish. So I kind of thought like, well, if, if, it, if it would be so effective or there would be the potential to make it so effective, then somebody would have done it already. Like yeah. uh, I would see those cases and there's some, I know people could play with it and, and do a good job, but, but I wasn't, I didn't have like a mind blowing experience of, oh, this makes so much yeah. sense in a yeah. functional way. Right. And so I never expected that. I was like, I would ask people, so how would you pull off this? Okay, so, so how would you pull off this like wrist lock or something and they would show me and I was like, oh, that's fun. Mm. But this was the first time when I was like, oh my gosh, 
there's really like I can see yeah. Yeah. the application yeah, of it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's a question how much Aikido it is mm. anymore, but the inspiration to explore these things comes from Aikido. Right. Aikido is supposed to do these things, and if I could integrate them in my combat sports, mm. uh, from what you showed, that's yeah. like. I feel like that could really make a big difference. Yeah. So that that was really impactful for me. So maybe the the te technique in itself right. was never like uh, unrealistic, mm -hmm. but what was missing was was the bridge right. to take it from isolation to improvisation. Right. You need you, you just needed some a few more principles to right. from the wrestling to make it work. Right. So. I think so. Yeah, it's interesting you found that. Yeah, no, so I have to be honest, very grateful. I have to say, I have to put it on record that, yeah, it was very impactful, much more impactful than I expected. Cool. Like, I thought, like, oh, it'll be nice, it'll be fun. No. But there, I was like, whoa, I can, like, really do something with this. Yeah. And that's cool. Very cool. It's probably a good time to go for us, right? Yeah. We, okay. <laughs> okay. So, since we're on record, thank you so yeah. much, Oliver. This, uh, of course. This it was, was a pleasure a, having you here. <laughs> it was an honor to be here. Yeah.